why don't you share with us uh, what has been your message to people? Who are you targeting? And what is your main message to people uh, yeah. regarding this uh, last two weeks? Yeah, this one, alhamdulillah, um, alhamdulillah. So it depends on who we're talking to, right? We have to differentiate between audiences. When it comes to talking to Muslims, we need the Muslims to feel empowered and like their voice matters. Um, the other night, you know, we have a, a video that's currently going viral that was taken from our live stream at Yaqeen Institute with Sami Hamdi, where he, you know, he was responding to a question from a sister about, we feel so uh, powerless here in the West, like we can't do anything. And Sammy did a wonderful job over the course of 25 minutes demonstrating that popular opinion really does matter. Uh, social media posts actually do matter. I know a lot of people, they criticize sort of keyboard activism and just, you know, likes and shares and stuff like that. And there's a degree and a dimension to which that is true, but it's not, this is a false dilemma, actually, in reality, that these two things are all tools in the toolbox. They're all tactics that are part of a greater strategy. And what we see unfolding is that popular opinion, especially in the Muslim world, but also in the West as well, is actually has a lot of the governments shaking in their boots and walking back from the positions of normalization and just allowing this stuff to happen that had been the status quo or the quickly forming status quo uh, for two weeks ago. So, you know, it's a psyop, if you will. It's 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 a, a psychological warfare or a tactic of psychological warfare to make us give up and think that we can't do anything, we can't change anything, or that the few maybe indirect things that we can do don't have any effect. Actually, they do. Um, they're not they're not effective in isolation, but they're part of a larger toolbox and a larger strategy of several tactics that if we actually were to coordinate and have them all working together, uh, that would be very, very effective, inshallah. So if I'm talking to Muslims, that's what I'm trying to, uh, message number one is to don't underestimate the good that you can do. Even sharing and hitting the algorithm and trying to push the conversation has already done a surprising amount of work. We've had CNN and major news corporations apologize <laughs> for the first time ever for their lies. Usually they just lie and then they forget about it. They're actually apologizing for their lies. We're holding them to account in a way mm -hmm. that we've never really seen before. The second thing I try to tell Muslims is this is not the time for infighting. This is not the time to score points for your personal grudge or the grudge of your, uh, your group or the grudge of your, you know, your sector, your movement. This is, if we can't unite on this issue, then we will not be able to unite about anything. Uh, so if you've got, you know, okay, you're from this movement or that movement or this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle, this is something where this has to wait, that we have to be united, not just present a united front, but be united on this issue as much as we can be, because we know that our enemies and our opposition are always going to attempt to exploit the chinks in our armor. And the, the biggest chink in our, in our armor is our lack of ability to, to unite. This even has to do with the people who are, um, who are on the ground and more physically affected. Sometimes people, they conflate the governments of Muslim nations with the Muslim populace. And they'll say, the Arabs have betrayed us or the Muslims have betrayed us. When when you've got tens of thousands of people in Arab countries, in Muslim countries that are hitting the streets, that are, you know, showing up at the embassies, that are doing what they can, and they're met with bullets, they're met with violence, they're met with the government security forces. This is another PSYOP. This is another attempt to get us to give up and to turn against each other. The Muslim people are united. The Muslim people are together. Our governments are working, often they're working against us. We've been able to push them on some things. We'll see how things keep unfolding. But don't give in to this idea that everybody's just betrayed and there's no good in the ummah and all the scholars are cowards. And No, no. There are scholars out there that are being brave, that are speaking up. The Muslim masses are speaking up and they're coming through. We need to have a collaborative mindset and be aware that they are the opposition and the enemy is going to attempt to break our ranks and make us feel defeated and make us try to fight amongst ourselves. If I'm talking to a non-Muslim, I'm trying to do two things. I'm trying to, and I published, we published on, um, on the Utica Meshi channel. Um, I went into the local conservative talk radio and I had a, a 25 minute sort of showdown with them. Um, there's two main things that I, I like to highlight. It depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to somebody who's conservative or someone on the right, I try to go right for the idea of truth and what to believe. Okay. Because just two weeks ago, you were telling me that you can't believe anything that Biden says. You were telling me that you can't believe anything the mainstream media says. Mm -hmm. And now 
all of the main media organizations have lined up to bang the drums of war to try to cheerlead rah, rah, rah for Israel and its massacre of Palestinians. And now all of a sudden you believe everything they say. Joe yep. Biden gets on the camera and he says to the entire nation that he saw a picture. You know, he can't see anything, let alone a picture of 40 babies supposedly being massacred. It was a lie. It was a lie. And so now, now all of a sudden everybody believes him. No one's critical. CNN is literally has become a mouthpiece of the IDF. They mm -hmm. invite, they invite Israeli journal, uh, excuse me, generals and military personnel to spew their version of the, of the, you know, the fake news. They're taking literally, they're taking what they say as gospel and running with it. And now no one's critical anymore. Now you have conservatives believing it, right? Like they come with some, now, what was it today? Some fake, uh, fake conversation between two <laughs> supposed Palestinian militants. That's a joke. Admitting, admitting to supposedly admitting to having <laughs> to, to having been responsible for the for the hospital attack how can people be so dumb and naive americans alhamdulillah if there's one thing that they hate they hate to feel like they're getting that like they're 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 dummies they hate to feel like they're getting taken advantage of or they're being lied to and most people actually distrust the media and distrust the government which is why you have to hammer them on this why are you trusting them now yep. you know that they lie they've lied time and time and time and time and time again how could you possibly believe them now yep. um and the other thing that i'm that i'm trying to hammer if you're talking to someone more on the left is just the absolute the absolute hypocrisy uh, that's going on when it comes to how things are, are are treated. And sometimes flipping the language makes it come home because the Israeli propaganda machine is extremely shrewd in the language that they choose and the tactics that they use. But you're able to flip it. We should start calling it a holocaust. This is a holocaust of Palestinians. We yeah. should start calling Gaza a concentration camp. It's not just an open air prison. It's a concentration camp. These are things that, you know, uh, they're discursively very powerful. So these are just some <laughs> just off the top of my head. I'm sure you and me, we have not been sleeping all week. You know, uh, the sentences are all running together and, the, mm -hmm. and the, the ideas are getting confused. But those are some of the main points that I've been trying to hammer. What about the America first policy of the conservatives? All of a sudden exactly. that's out the window, too. Yes, on the, exactly. And on, when I went to the, 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 the conservative talk radio, I also brought that up. I referenced Candace Owens's tweet where she was very honest. She said, I don't understand why we should be sending soldiers or money to patrol another a foreign nation's borders. Yep. What happened? You know that the, the border is a big issue for them, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, who's sending soldiers and money to protect our borders? Yeah. And the answer is nobody, right? There's even people on the right who sympathize with the idea of stand your ground. It's like if you were a Palestinian, right? Yeah. It, you know, if you're someone in Florida and you believe in like the stand your ground laws, if you're a Palestinian and someone comes into your home, I don't care if they're telling me that they're doing this as a response to this or whatever. This is my home. Yeah. Right. And so there, that's a fundamental right to resist there that people can't deny. So that's what people I think when you're talking to non-Muslims, you're talking to Americans, you have to realize there's certain nodes of connectivity that mm -hmm. you can hit on discursively. What you, and you, but you have to know your audience, obviously, because the ones on the right are going to be different from the ones on the left. The ones on the right, they have different streams among them. Like we said, there's not everybody's a, an America first Republican, right? Like some people are have different sort of agendas, but you have to you have to hit on the thing that is meaningful to somebody and try to change the discourse and try to, tr to try to change the terms upon which this th entire discussion happened. I made a mistake. And, and, you know, in the, um, in that, that talk radio show that I went on, the first question they hit me with was what is Hamas? And they caught me off guard because it seemed to be an innocuous question. And I'm not satisfied with the way I answered it. Um, I sort of played the, like, I don't know, how am I supposed to know? Muslims are always expected to know. And how can we, what yeah. I would say, if I was in that studio again, I would say, tell me what is Israel? And I'll yeah. tell you what Hamas is mm -hmm. because if, because you cannot, you, there is no such thing as Hamas without Israel. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, like we can, you can disagree with some of the tactics or the things that they're accused of. You know, I don't know if it's true or not. This is fog of war. This is, you know, propaganda. If they're targeting, you know, uh, if they're truly targeting civilians, obviously that's something that's against Islam and we don't believe in, but you can't take away the context and the entire Israeli propaganda is dedicated to taking away the context. This is not about October 7th. This is about 1947. This is about the entire history of the region and the reason, like how Israel came into existence in the first place. If you want to address the issues, you want to make Hamas go away, you want to make the resistance and the rockets and the whatever go away, you have to end the occupation. There's no way out without ending the occupation. First period, end of sentence.
let's talk about uh, Hamas again for a second, because it's often often used the scapegoat as, you know, Hamas yeah. is there. We got to go in. All right, right. Well, what about the West Bank where there's no Hamas? They have oh, no course. influence in the West Bank. Why yeah. are people getting killed there? Yeah. Right. So no, if Hamas you flip is the just, language. If, yeah. if you flip the language, if you if you re- take anybody's sentences and replace Hamas with IDF and replace Israel with Hamas, and they would never accept it. Yeah. This is why you have to you have to force people to try to be consistent. At least then they'll admit that they're just racist bigots or, or whatever it is. But people they hide behind these sorts of things. Um, they don't realize how dehumanized and desensitized they've been to the slaughter of Palestinians. They re- reveal it in certain moments, but to really hold them to account. Okay, so if Hamas, what if Hamas said, well, we've been uh, targeted by the IDF, and so we're going to go in, and if there's civilian casualties, then so be it. Nobody would accept that. Mm-hmm. It would be 24-hour nightly news, yeah. right? And that's the other thing, that's the other thing that, that cracks me up about the way that this is covered, because look at how bloodthirsty and even deranged yeah. some of the Israeli military commanders are when they get on screen. Yeah. They have bloodlust in their eyes. They mm-hmm. talk about they talk about grinding Gaza into dust, and mm-hmm. they talk about not letting anything survive, and they talk about all these things. If a single, if they had a quote from a single Hamas militant saying anything close to that, mm-hmm. it would be nonstop coverage. It would be nonstop coverage. It would be plastered they, everywhere. Yep. It'd be plastered everywhere, but they can't do it. Here's the face of barbarity right in front of you. Mm-hmm. But because we also pair it with sa- sob stories about their dogs and their, you know, cafes or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Now, all of a sudden that this is something that we accept. Allah uh, Like you said, everyone the past two weeks has been, you know, glued to their phones, you know, catching up with what's happening. I'll tell you what I haven't caught up with. Mm. The latest hospital uh, uh, bombing is this another hoax that we're coming upon that they did it to themselves, that they were using it for a weapon Zippo, mm-hmm. that they were using it um, for hostages, that they did it to themselves to make Israel look bad. The amount of stories that have and come out regarding the hospital hoax that, well, it's not even a hoax. It, it Well, now they're saying it didn't even happen. It was the parking lot and 500 people didn't die. The right. number of stories that have come out uh, that are complete polar opposite to one another, constant changing is more than any other of these hoaxes and stories. I haven't been able to catch up. Can you give us, what do you, what is the latest you caught up with in terms of the truth about the hospital bombing? Um, I, I read a really good thread on Twitter today that was from uh, someone with an Italian first name. That's all I can remember mm-hmm. <laughs> who was going into the, the ammunitions sort of uh, possibilities and, and you know, which types of missiles leave craters and which don't and what you can expect and these sorts of things. Um, but I'll, I'll highlight two things before even getting into that. One is that I've noticed distinctively the um, people pointing out the history of sort of like the, the character of the witness. Right. If you have a lot, right. If you have a, a courtroom setting, you understand that there's a, a character portrait or a character witness, somebody who comes and they say, well, this is what this person is known for. Yeah. So if somebody is known for telling the truth, then that person's testimony is taken in a different way than if somebody is known for lying or exaggerating. Israel, the IDF, the Israeli government has a clear, not just history an addiction to lying, to murdering people and lying mm-hmm. about it. The Christian Palestinian woman, the journalist who was murdered, they did the exact same thing. They murdered her in cold blood. They denied it. They blamed the Palestinians. Then eventually they kind of, uh, uh, you know, introduced a bunch of different narratives and then down the line, they admitted to it. Back when they, you know, in previous sort of escalations, they've done the same thing with schools and hospitals where they bombed them. They killed tons of civilians. They denied it. They blamed the Palestinians, they blame this faction, that faction. Um, and then eventually down the road, they deny it after sort of the moment sort of has passed. So if you look at the playbook, the playbook makes you at, le- at the very least suspect that Israel is acting fishy. In addition to all of the sort of revisionism that's going on in the tweets of official spokespeople for the IDF. Like you've seen people that they were actually bragging and taking credit for it at first, in the first few moments of the attack. And then those quickly got deleted. Which usually when the truth comes out. Yes, exactly. And there were video, supposed videos, once they they peddled and pivoted towards actually, no, this was Hamas or this was PIJ or this was this group or that group. um, And they posted a supposed video with three separate videos supposedly demonstrating 
that this was done by the Palestinians to themselves, um, either by accident or on purpose. Then every, one by one, those videos were demonstrated to be false, that they were from 2022 or they were from previous years. And so then the ID, these people actually edited their tweets to remove the videos that they had actually posted to corroborate their details. Mm. What does that tell you? Yeah. There, was, there was somebody, I think the, the Twitter account was called Farida Khan or something like this, claiming to be an Al Jazeera English correspondent claiming that she saw with her own eyes eyewitness account a rocket that was fired from the from a Palestinian faction that hit the that hit the hospital yep. Al Jazeera comes out and says we don't know who this person is this person is not one of us look at the type where are the lies coming from like yeah. where what in what direction who's trying to cover their tracks right if you're you know if you're not caught red-handed but you're caught with crumbs in your mouth Right. Yep. Then I'm going to suspect you of eating the last cookie in the cookie jar. Right. And that's the situation that we have here. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing, subhanAllah, I've been really amazed by all of the Bosnian brothers and sisters that have spoken up throughout the duration of this conflict and how they've said that this is exactly the different tricks that the Serbians used against us mm. in the 90s. Like when it comes to the safe zones, the UN, supposed UN safe zones, obviously was Srebrenica, right? This is exactly what happened. But particular to the, the, the hospital um, calamity, when it comes to blaming us, Every single time the Serbs attacked us, the Bosnians said they would blame us. They said, we're attacking our own, our own people, these animals, these bloodthirsty savages. They attack their own people, this group and this group. Like, so this is a well-known propaganda trick. When it comes to the actual sort of forensic evidence, these things are unfolding. I've been in meetings all afternoon. I haven't checked my, my phone and, and updates since probably 11 o'clock this morning. But the last that I saw, um, there is severe doubt that the type of explosion that occurred at the hospital could have possibly been done. If you even forget about all that we've said about the revisionism and the editing of tweets and the all this stuff, that when it comes to the capacities, the military capacities of the, uh, of the forces that are in Gaza, that there is significant doubt that this could have been done by their capacity compared with the types of weaponry that the IDF is known to, to have. In addition to the fact that they two days before or in the in the two days leading up to it, the IDF said that they were going to bomb the hospital. They warned the hospital to evacuate because yeah. they were going to bomb it. Yeah. So you tell me, yeah. you tell me who, who has the shadow of suspicion over them. I think that it's we have everything except the the last piece. Again, according to the last thing that I've read, we have everything except the fi like confession and everything uh, except, you know, the, 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 the final in incontrovertible piece of evidence. But all signs seem to point to uh, the, the suspects or the aggressors in this situation. So they said they were going to bomb it. They told everyone to evacuate. Yeah. And they took credit for the bombing immediately, yeah. then pulled yeah. down that tweet. Omar, yeah. if, you could, if you could look that up, it's probably somewhere in our WhatsApp, that they literally said it. It's translated from Arabic. They have one that's in English. Uh, where they said that they did it, then took it down, then created all sorts of stories. And today's story is a complete um, uh, gaslighting of the whole world by saying 500 people didn't die. And it was yeah. just a parking lot explosion. Right. So you're literally gaslighting the whole world um, in, in, in with this, this yeah. uh, catastrophe, which is worse than all the other ones. Because the other two, the other yeah. two hoaxes were accusations of themselves getting killed yes exactly. now the script is turned the numbers are far greater the target is far more vulnerable the whole world doesn't expect accept this and we have tons of evidence that it happened and that you did it so this one is the worst of all and in a, in a democratic world that we live in with information the information war is a critical part of the battle yep. and s regular citizens have a role to play in this. It's not like you can't do anything. Jake Shields, which is a fighter, has been one of the best yep. online at exposing yep. these hoaxes. And the guy is just a fighter, right? He has, yeah. he has no dog in the fight. Neither is he Jewish nor Palestinian, right? Mm -hmm. He's literally like a MMA guy, a retired MMA guy. There are a lot of people out there who have been, um, just came out of the woodworks exposing the lies of the enemy in democratic societies such as the United States. Yeah. People and that's move. our greatest hope. That's, I think that's our greatest hope is that mm -hmm. there's still enough people who care about the truth 
and that information has been democratized to an unprecedented level. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's completely, obviously, if you're on a meta platform, it's much more heavily censored than a non-meta platform. Um, even YouTube, I was watching, <laughs> I was watching Al Jazeera News live uh, in Arabic, and they have yep. a, a thing that you have to read. <laughs> it says, it's cited from Wikipedia, you know, the, the grand source of all that is objective and holy, Wikipedia. Yeah. And it said that Al Jazeera is completely or partly funded by the Qatari uh, yeah. Sovereign Wealth Fund. It's yeah. like, oh, okay, very good. So everybody has their disclaimers. Everybody has their context mm -hmm. and, and, and their spin, yeah. you know, but everybody also has much more of a voice and much more of a platform. And so even if your platform is just the 10 people around you or the 20 people around you or your group of friends, your group of colleagues, your group of college, you know, classmates, your group of, you know, people that you see at work, that's your audience, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody has the ability to change hearts and minds. Most people want to do what's right. I hope most people care about truth and justice. And if we continue to prove that the that truth and justice is on the side of the Palestinians, then I think, inshallah, we have more hope than we've ever had with the particular um, Zionist aggression in Palestine of getting something really special um, done. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. I mean, uh, and when you have a platform, you have a lot of ability to do a lot of amazing things or big things. Simultaneously, you're oftentimes not a fair arbiter because you have too many ties to the world. You have too much, you have sources of income, you have donors or investors. Daily Wire is one of these examples. It's a massive operation. It's now being revealed that it's funding is coming from high, very high ups in Israel. He's literally a mouthpiece for Israel now. And I think now people are starting to realize that this guy cannot talk about Israel at all. He's financially tied to them. He's already, we know he's personally tied to them uh, uh, himself as a Jew. So at that point, people like, you know, people saying here, Sam Hinkle, Jake Shields, uh, who? Jackson Hinkle. Uh, Ryan Dawson, Keith Woods. One of the reasons for this is that when someone outside the realm of influence or connection says the truth, just as you said earlier, there is a, a ki kind of analysis of, of character witness. When the truth comes from an outsider, it actually is more valuable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I love to hear the truth from other than myself. When a Christian came and reported that he saw the dead jet, the same exact, he didn't say the word Dajjad, but he described what the prophet had described to the Sahaba. And that was Tamim me Daddy. And he was yep. a Christian at the time when he saw what he saw. And it was exactly what the prophet told his Sahaba about. And the prophet's comment on that is, I'd love to hear the truth from other than myself, because it, it, it adds to it in the minds of people. So people who have an established, who, who have an, a, a, a platform have a lot of power but their take as a, their, their accounts as witnesses is not as strong as strangers out there, people who are completely disconnected, who are now bringing the truth because they have no uh, ties to it. And what I'm seeing here and what we have to see here is that you're on the losing side of history if you're pro-Israel in this, in this world. As I said yesterday is live stream, the Jewish uh, story to me is in three parts. The first part, what's happening, Omar? You good? Is, your, is his mic on? Turn his mic on. The first part is in Europe, and they were truly the victims. The second part was a gray area, was in the British mandate, when they're coming as settler, settlers who hope to colonize, fighting a colonizer who doesn't hope to settle. Like, yep. neither of you are, you're the same. There's no victim yep. here. Did what the Jews did to the British, the Zionists did to the British, and the British did to them, it's sort of a gray area. There's not one particular person who's innocent or guilty. Now, the Zionists has taken over Palestine. Now they went from victim to villain. And everything they do to the people, to the Palestinian people, go watch the videos of people like Benny Morris, early time before he retracted everything, and Ilan Pepe. They're going to talk a lot about the oral history. And we showed videos of the genocidal mindset of, of these people. Now, uh, do you think that the, have, from what you've been hearing, 
that American troops are ever going to touch ground in Gaza. Because um, at that point, yeah, right. You're now you're cheerleading them on, you're paying for it. That's one thing. Right. Actually physically going is a whole nother story. Okay. Well, uh, I'll answer this and then unfortunately I have to sign off because I have to go teach a class. But no um, problem. But um, uh, this isn't my area of expertise. I'm a political theorist. I'm not a political analyst, such as someone like uh, Sammy Hamdi or, or, or someone like that. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. But I would be I would be shocked. I think that it would um, it would be immensely unpopular. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that right now, uh, and this is largely taking from other political analysts, sort of uh, analysis of everything unfolding. Um, there definitely, there's an interest to have de-escalation, right? Because remember that before all this was going on, the hope was for normalization. Mm -hmm. The further that things escalate, the more that normalization is going to be very, very difficult after yep. the fact, yep. right? You saw how Saudi Arabia turned off of the, turned away or turned back from the precipice of normalization. And now public opinion is so in the favor of, of Gaza and, and Palestine that, you know, th they have an emergency meeting right now in Jeddah, right? Who knows? Maybe it won't amount to anything, but we can hope. Maybe the public opinion will continue to be very loud and continue to advocate to the point where it forces their hand, where they're going to do something economically. They're going to do anything. Who knows? Right? So I think that uh, the, the long game for both Israel and for the United States, they want normalization of ties, normalization of commerce, normalization of, of sort of military cooperation. And the further and further it escalates, I think that the more and more that that's off the table. So I, I would be surprised if you saw boots on the ground, I think it would be very, very unpopular. I think it would help put fuel on the flames of the narratives that we've been talking about, about how this doesn't make sense from an America first mindset. This doesn't make sense from a humanitarian mindset. This doesn't make sense from, from a lot of different sort of avenues. Um, you can't necessarily tell how much saber rattling is completely accurate. Obviously, Iran has been doing a lot of saber rattling recently. Um, Turkey also today, Erdogan said, if you don't stop it, we will. Again, that could just be empty words, but who knows? So mm -hmm. I don't think I would be surprised. I'd be surprised if we saw that type of escalation from the United States. And we, we hope it doesn't get to that, but we, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he, um, that he demonstrates in a clear way, his power and his might, and that he makes the truth apparent from the falsehood and that he helps the I mean, people of Philistine and makes them victorious. I mean, I'm um, just closing remarks. I'd be surprised if they continue this because they're looking terrible uh, and it's normalization is going further away from them. And I don't even see that it's a war anymore because yeah. when was the last time you heard of anything coming against Israel? Everything is one directional now. If they want to turn this thing off, I think they could turn this thing off on the spot. Right. Um, so they're probably weighing whether we want to swallow up as much as Gaza and eliminate a million people out of the country. Right. That's one thing that they could have. The second thing is turn this thing off quickly and go back to normalization. It's all about what they prioritize, right? Because they could turn yeah. this thing off and end it immediately. There's, there's not a right. war happening anymore. It's no, a one-sided no, operation. Yeah, it's a massacre. So, thank you for coming on. Right, Inshallah, right. our uh, political theory correspondent uh, that we'd love to have you on again for more insight anytime you want. But sure. ten, five, ten minutes even uh, to share your insights with our audience. They love hearing from you. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, and well, you can watch all of Imam Tom's stuff on the Utica Masjid YouTube channel, on his own social media pages, and now on Yaqeen. Very uh, nicely done videos. Uh, on uh, uh, various subjects on Yaqeen Institute's website and YouTube channel. Thanks a lot, Imam Tom. Jazakallah khair. We'll see you soon. Amin wa alaikum. Wa alaikum